Welcome to our webinar for the Ohio State University Master of Respiratory Therapy program. We're thrilled to have you and thanks to all that registered to join us either live or via the archived version of this presentation. We will be recording it, so welcome all participants. My name is Georgiana Sergekis and I'm the program director and I have the pleasure of introducing the webinar and our speakers. We will get started in a moment, but as an introduction, we're here to discuss the program which has been developed to prepare advanced practice respiratory therapists. Our first cohort of students was admitted this semester, so we're already underway and they will graduate in May of 2021. Just some business items to begin. The Zoom system will be utilized for this webinar. We wanna let you know that in order to make sure we can, you can all hear us, we will be muting all attendees and turning off video from our end. Please feel free to utilize the chat function to ask questions throughout. As you can see here, there's an illustration where to find the chat. Uh, you open the chat box and you type your question to the host and we will get, um, keep track of these questions throughout and have saved time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. If you have individual questions about your specific circumstances, please send an email at the end of the session to the email provided. We also provided our website link in case you're interested in more information. Our presenters today will be myself, Sarah Vercogis, our Director of Clinical Education, and Jessica Schweller, who's faculty and a clinical instructor. The webinar will help you understand how and why the program was designed, requirements of the program, benefits of earning the MRT at Ohio State, details about the application process, resources available to students, and what you can expect as an MRT student. So let's get started. Sarah Varkotis will talk to us about program design. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm excited to share with you kind of our, our process that we've gone through to develop um, what we're calling a new profession. So I think it's really important as we get started, I wanna be very, very clear, this is not an AP, a respiratory therapist practicing at the top of their scope. This is a pro new professional. Um, the background, it builds on um, somebody that's prepared with a bachelor's degree in respiratory therapy with a re registered respiratory therapist credential to develop, again, a new advanced practice professional uniquely prepared to care with patients with cardiopulmonary disease. This really establishes a clinical ladder that we haven't had in respiratory therapy before. It does require a master's degree in respiratory therapy with, again, a clinical focus. Um, and the role of this person, we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but it's really provide patient services under the supervision and the responsibility of a licensed physician. And again, to reiterate, this is really not an RRT that's practicing at the top of his or her scope. This is a new profession with a different scope. So in the process of creating this advanced practice respiratory therapist, um, we've kind of gone through a, a process that started with determining a need and an interest in this professional. Um, this was kind of done both on a local and a national level, and I'm going to talk about both of those. We really also had to gather support um, from our RT professional organizations, including the AARC, the NBRC, and COARC, as well as all of our sponsoring physician organizations, ATS, CHEST, Society for Critical Care Medicine, um, American Anesthesiology Association, lots and lots of our supporting physicians. And then we also, um, in order to be able to implement licensure, we have been working with the State Medical Board of Ohio um, on some licensure initiatives. The implementation phase, again, the, includes the development of an educational program, which the second part of this, you'll hear more about that. Um, I mentioned licensure a few minutes ago when we were talking about getting support from the State Medical Board. And then also the development of a credential, and you'll hear some more information about that process through this webinar as well. So there was an editorial um, published in Respiratory Care in March of 2017 um, by Dr. Kasmerik and Dr. Walsh. And this really was focused on entry to practice degree requirements um, and advocating for a baccalaureate degree as the minimum educational level. Um, while this debate is outside of the scope of kind of what we're talking about today, they do mention several important things kind of to consider in the context of degree advancement and advanced practice. And they write, it is clear to us that autonomy is explicitly linked to educational level. Many respiratory therapists with advanced degrees practice in roles that are essential to the advancement of the profession. 
So both are an essential part of developing a career pathway, an advanced career pathway for respiratory therapists. Um, a bachelor's degree preparation, building on with a master's degree building on that foundation. So that's how our program has been designed. And oftentimes we get questions kind of like, why now? Or why, why is this something that we're, that we're starting to work on here in, in 2020, 2019 actually is when we initiated in 2020. So there's really no secret that there's significant changes in healthcare right now. And some of these challenges are really projected to get worse in the not so distant future. Um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said that in 2000, the period of 2013 to 2015, job openings were outpacing job hires. I know in our area that has continued to, um, to be the trend. Um, demand for healthcare professionals continues to grow between healthcare reform and an aging population. Those two things right there um, have increased demand. And the, the shortages that we're experiencing are continuing and actually projected to get worse. So a lot of that is due to retirements. We've been hearing a lot about that. That goes along with our aging population. Um, and there's new jobs and new roles that have been formed to develop uh, due to healthcare reform, care coordinators, health coaches, documentation specialists, patient navigators. And while those are all wonderful um, opportunities for healthcare professionals to pursue, those have taken away from some of the other healthcare providers that are providing direct care at the bedside. In addition, the Association of American Medical Colleges has predicted that by 2025, the physician shortage will increase from about 46,000 in 2016 to over 90,000. So many existing healthcare workforce roles are taking on new importance. You guys are definitely seeing um, an increase in re retail care, urgent care, home health care, other treatment settings where services are needed. Um, and that's an opportunity maybe for us to cap capitalize on advanced practice practitioner opportunities. And the rise of the advanced practice um, uh, practitioners really provided autonomous and independent healthcare services to fulfill, fulfill these physician gaps that we're seeing. I have a list here. I'm not sure this is even a comprehensive list. These are the ones that I'm most familiar with. And I, we were, are hoping to add the advanced practice respiratory therapist to this list. So we were at a point where we were saying, what do we see? Do we see a glass half full or a glass half empty with these challenges and the, the workforce shortages with physicians? And so there was a group that um, was formed that um, included members from the NBRC, from the AARC, and from COARC. Looking at, in the literature, can we identify that there is a gap in care that exists for patients with cardiopulmonary disease? Your respiratory therapists really are cardiopulmonary specialists. And so they wanted to see is there is trying to establish a need for an advanced practice respiratory therapist to add to those other advanced practice providers on that previous slide, is there really a gap in the literature? Um, this is a publication that resulted from the work that this group did. It has been accepted for publication in CHEST. Um, it is, this is um, a screenshot of the EPUB that's available ahead of print. Um, so the print version will be available very soon. Um, but I just wanted to share with you the conclusions from that study. And it demonstrated that gaps between the availability of providers and the needs of persons with cardiopulmonary disease exist across all clinical settings. And it is alarming that these gaps span major healthcare settings, including ambulatory critical care and post-acute care, as well as several cardiopulmonary specialty areas. And again, there are no other studies that they were aware of that refuted those findings. And a frequently cited solution in literature was to use advanced practice providers to fill these gaps. However, currently available advanced practice providers often lack the specialty cardiopulmonary training and usually provided care and education to lower acuity patients. Improving preparatory training of current AAPs or expanding the AAP role to specifically trained AAP providers with cardiopulmonary expertise are options that alleviate the identified workforce gap. And they're referring to, again, the advanced practice respiratory therapist. In addition, on a national level, that same group that uh, has membership from the NBRC, the AARC, and COARC um, conducted a national needs assessment. They contracted with a third party um, to conduct a, a survey of 1,401 physicians whose practice primarily includes cardiopulmonary patients. Um, they represented a variety of different specialties, including anesthesia, sleep, critical care, pulmonary, pediatrics, allergy, um, all that would likely have a significant portion of their patients with cardiopulmonary disease. 
The results of this study are under review for publication in respiratory care, and hopefully that publication will be available to all of us very soon. Um, but the overarching result was that about 70% of those surveyed agree there is a current and a future need for an advanced practice provider with specialized training to care for patients with cardiopulmonary disease. I think between those two publications, we've pretty clearly identified that there is a need and then there's also an interest. And that was on a national level. And so we um, conducted kind of our own local needs assessment, um, looking for, again, need for an interest in an advanced practice respiratory therapist here in the state of Ohio. We conducted that study uh, survey in 2012, and it included um, respiratory care department directors as well as the medical directors for the respiratory care departments here in Ohio. It was published in 2014 in the Respiratory Care Education Annual. And the results were that um, we identified um, about six kind of overarching goals or roles and responsibilities of an advanced practice respiratory therapist. And we had 87% um, uh, and higher agreement that those would be important roles for an advanced practice respiratory therapist. And in addition, we identified um, some benefits, both to the patient and to the healthcare facility, um, of including an advanced practice respiratory therapist as part of the team that cares for cardiopulmonary patients. And we had an 82% and higher a level of agreement um, for all of those benefits. So here in Ohio, we determined from that study that there is a widespread need for an APRT in Ohio and that there are significant expected benefits to both patients and employers of APRTs. And we use those results, that re the results of that needs assessment to inform the development of a degree proposal for a master in respiratory therapy graduate program here at Ohio State. We also felt that there are results um, support the need for graduate level education in other states potentially and encouraged others to consider um, conducting a similar study to see what the need was in their area. About the same time we started working on our needs assessment, David Shelley, David Vines, and Jonathan Waugh started working with the respiratory care section of the Society for Critical Care Medicine on a DACUM process. And DACUM kind of stands for developing a curriculum. And they were looking at, again, what would, um, what would, be, part, what would the, be the training needs for an advanced practice respiratory therapist. The DACUM project process is a structured process that's used in developing competency-based education curriculum development. You analyze jobs, job roles, or duties and tasks that are associated with a specific profession or occupation. Um, and it allows you to identify knowledge, skills, and affective characteristics that are needed by an individual to perform in that job. Um, a facilitator leads a group of experts to identify the jobs, roles, and tasks, and then those results are used to develop specific performance objectives, learning activities, and evaluation methods. You eventually sequence those into specific courses, units of instruction, and modules of study, which results in ultimately a curriculum. So we're very thankful for, for David Shelley, David Vines, and Jonathan Wall for their work on this project. They used, again, the Respiratory Care Committee and the Society for Critical Care Medicine. That was their expert panel. There were about 13 pulmonary physicians that were involved in this process. The first direction that this group of, of experts received was to list all tasks, procedures, and competencies needed for training an advanced practice respiratory therapist to function as a pulmonary or critical care physician assistant. They originally identified 75 competencies that would be needed in outpatient, um, in the adult ICU as an additional 70, inpatient um, care of patients an additional 18, resulted in a total of 163 competencies. From there, they were asked to rate each of those 163 tasks or procedures in terms of importance for the training and practice of an APRT. And about 85% of those competencies it works out to about 140 were rated at a 3.5 or higher on a five point Likert scale of importance. And if you could summarize, I guess, those 140 competencies into really, really big buckets, there's a lot more detail, obviously, but patient assessment, develop and carry out patient um, care plans, perform specific tasks and procedures, and there's long lists of those, in addition to professional characteristics, and then some practice management skills, um, was really kind of how they put it all together. And really remember, the ultimate goal of this process 
is to use the results to develop specific performance objectives, those learning activities and evaluation methods that are needed to put together into specific courses and units of instruction and modules to result in a curriculum. The results of this project give us a little bit more concrete direction into the process of developing our new program. And this was much, much more specific than the, the needs assessment that we had conducted here in Ohio. And so we kind of put all of those together when we were thinking about developing our curriculum. At the time of the DACOM study, David Shelley was actually serving as a COARC board member. For those of you that are not as familiar, COARC is the accreditation agency for respiratory care education, um, entry level as well as degree advancement. And so he shared the results um, of that DACOM study with COARC um, so that they could develop uh, accreditation standards for an APRT educational program. As you can imagine, it's a process. Um, they do have um, collaborating organizations that they work with, including the AARC, American College of Chest Physicians, ATS, and the ASA. Um, they went through policy and procedures um, and an open comment period. Um, and finally, in November of 2016, the APRT standards became effective. These um, Standards do require that a sponsoring academic organization award a master's degree or higher, and that the APRT st students be graduates of COARC accredited entry to practice programs and hold the RRT credential. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we've interpreted that for our admission standards in just a minute. I mentioned before that there was a, a committee um, that had representatives from the AARC, COARC, and NBRC. Um, they also have been working um, on developing, kind of defining, putting some arms around what is an advanced practice respiratory therapist. As I mentioned, um, they, the very first bullet on your screen, they were very clear. They wanted to be very declarative and say it's a trained, credentialed, licensed respiratory care practitioner who is employed to provide a scope of practice that exceeds that of the RRT. And that after obtaining your RRT credential, you must complete a CARC accredited graduate level education and training program that provides a curricular emphasis that enables the APRT to provide evidence-based complex diagnostic and therapeutic clinical practice and disease management. And that fits very well with what was found in the DACOM study, kind of those big buckets that I mentioned that would be practice opportunities for an APRT. From the COARC standards, they got a little bit more specific, kind of in, in trying to put some parameters around what is an APRT. And they describe in the introduction to their standards that under the leadership of a supervising physician, an APRT would be trained to assess patients, develop care plans, order and provide this care, and evaluate and modify the care based on the patient's response to therapy. So we would need educational programs that prepare clinician, clinical practitioners with advanced knowledge and skills in basic and clinical sciences, who are able to assess patients to plan and deliver high quality cost effective healthcare that would be able to, to kind of serve our where we commonly find our cardiopulmonary patients and that would prepare individuals for research in the laboratory and in clinical practice. They go on to say that they would serve as a physician extender in pulmonary and critical care, that they could provide access to cost effective quality care by facilitating implementation of clinical treatment protocols, management and weaning of patients from mechanical ventilation, and improving the appropriateness and the efficiency of respiratory care. The APRT would also ensure delivery of best practices, which would improve clinical outcomes, improve patient safety, optimize the allocation of respiratory care, and reduce the length of stay and hospital readmission. I think you'll see that as we progress through these slides, everything started to come together. And we had a lot of different places where many similar things were being said, both locally here in Ohio, as well as on a national stage. And so that really kind of prompted us to try to take the next steps and to develop um, our program. I'm gonna turn the presentation over to, back over to Georgiana at this point. She's gonna talk a little bit more about what are included in our program requirements. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just want to remind everyone, if you joined us a few minutes late or didn't hear the message at the beginning, we do have the chat function available and we encourage you to ask questions. We're, we're not getting a lot of questions, but we want to encourage you to put those into the chat so that we can uh, uh, look for themes and, and answer your questions at the end. We're saving some time at the end. So we're about halfway through our prepared content, so we will have some time. 
Um, I'm excited to tell you about the program requirements, uh, about specifically about the Ohio State University MRT program. And really, the first thing to understand is that the admission to the program is competitive, and we uh, will uh, look at the most complete and highest qualifications to accept for the admission. It's a committee decision and the completion of the started selection criteria does not assure that you'd be admitted to the MRT program, but we want to tell you about our, our minimal criteria for admission. Uh, the first of which is uh, to be a graduate of a Bachelor of Science or MS degree from a COARC accredited entry level respiratory therapy program or a COARC accredited degree advancement program in respiratory care. Uh, you can see if your program that you graduated from is accredited by looking at the COARC website, and we've provided that here on our slide. Applicants also must be a registered respiratory therapist in good standing, as evidenced by your NBRC official credential verification letter. And our application materials page on our website really details how to download this information from the NBRC website if you are unsure. Uh, we also have minimum GPA requirements. Uh, students that are admitted to the MRT program are admitted actually to our graduate school at The Ohio State University. And this is a graduate school requirement to have a minimum GPA of 3.0 on a 4.0 scale. Uh, the GPA is computed using all grades earned from all institutions attended and only applicants with a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or higher on a 4.0 scale at the time of application will be evaluated for possible admission. As you can see, Ohio is a great place, uh, has one of the states that has the most COARC accredited uh, bachelor entry level programs. Um, we have five colleges or universities that award the BSRT entry to practice degree. And as you can see here on this, in this map from, uh, that's published on the Cobert website, that there are um, various numbers of programs in each state throughout the country but Ohio is one that has a concentration of BSRT programs. So what a wonderful place to provide the educational program for advanced practice. There are many pathways. If you haven't yet earned your BS degree or um, uh, applied to a degree advancement program, uh, if you go to the COARC website, which we have listed the website here, uh, you can see that there is a list. We didn't mean for you to be able to read this list, so sorry for the small print, but uh, this list is updated on a regular basis from COARC, and it lists the degree advancement programs that are available to you at either the um, uh, ma master's or the bachelor's level. So um, we encourage you to take a look at those programs if you're interested in advancing your degree to be ready to um, go from the RRT to the APRT program. Now let's talk about a little bit about the benefits of enrolling in our program. We have, uh, as Sarah stated previously, with the needs assessment data and the anticipated benefits, uh, we've kind of summarized the benefits of the APRT educational program here. Um, the first of which is that you can still advance your career and maintain a clinical focus. Uh, graduates of the MRT will have increased professional responsibility and the available of this advanced practice clinical masters will also hopefully retain those wonderful clinicians in our profession and provide an opportunity for professional advancement. So highly motivated and bright students like you uh, are ones that will have the option to pursue this advanced clinical graduate education, allowing you to stay in respiratory therapy. And we see that this professional advancement will also allow you to expand your practice. Um, this MRT program will help you expand your practice areas to areas like the outpatient setting, uh, allow for more flexibility in terms of schedule as well. And then final bucket, I guess, in the benefits of the APRT is that it's an efficient pathway to advanced practice. Uh, we have for years seen a trend in respiratory therapy students graduating from undergrad our undergraduate program and several other undergraduate programs throughout the country who want to look to expand their education in the clinical realm that have pursued advanced clinical practice by leaving the profession and pursued education in other professions such as medicine, nurse practitioner, and physician's assistant. This program is constructed so that it provides an efficient pathway to advanced clinical practice, and it really builds on your BS and RRT. This will save you money, this will save you time, and allow you to build upon what you already know. 
as a respiratory therapist practicing in the world, and as well as provide you with an efficient, efficient uh, educational advancement from a financial standpoint as well. The next slide I'm going to show you will demonstrate the number of credit hours total that are required for an RRT with a BS to become an advanced practice provider. As you can see here, if you pursue the BSRT plus the PA route, uh, the total credits required are 230. If you go BSRT to advanced practice nurse, um, and Sarah showed you the slide with the various uh, variations of that, the average number of credits required are 228. This MRT program is 47 graduate credit hours. Our website listed here will also help you explore estimates for tuition and other details, but those additional 47 credit hours are about half of what's required if you pursue other routes. And again, um, we hope to provide a very efficient way for you to become an advanced practice provider. The benefits to patients and healthcare facilities, as Sarah noted at the beginning of this webinar, are many, and the anticipated benefits of the APRT or MRT graduate are uh, you know, published in all those great publications that are either available or are coming soon. And as you can note from this graph, um, they echo the conclusions from the pu previous publications that we mentioned. Um, some highlights are that the benefits to patients and healthcare facilities healthcare facilities are that it will help facilitate implementation of clinical respiratory care, care medication and treatment protocols, improve communication between the respiratory care prescriber and therapists, better share evidence-based practice, and improve clinical outcomes. Those are just some of the highlights, but as you can see, the benefits that we've listed are many. So I'm ready to turn this over to Jessica Schweller, who's here to talk about the application process and what it takes to kind of move toward that application. So she will talk about that. Thank you, Georgiana. Uh, welcome. I'm here to kind of talk, talk about the nuts and bolts of how you can get into this program. So when we look at the application materials that are needed, uh, we do require that all transcripts from all coursework that the applicant has completed must be submitted. And this is from any undergraduate classes you've currently taken, any graduate classes that you've taken. We do require a resume. And what we want to see on the resume is that you've had uh, at least one year experience in your desired clinical specialty and can show evidence of that through the resume. Your personal statement is kind of your interview on paper that we start with. This is where we require that you let us know um, in a personal way that you've at least established and, and uh, had a direct career pathway that you've, you've shown your desired clinical specialty. It should also explain why you've decided to pursue the MRT and how your MRT degree is going to relate to your immediate and long-term professional goals. Describe how your personal, educational, and professional background will also help you to achieve these career goals. So this is where you get to show your time to shine as to why you want to be one of our students. We also require three letters of reference, and these letters of reference uh, must be coming from someone who you know personally or professionally. Family members are excluded. We do require that the first one is from a licensed and practicing physician that you have actually spent time clinically with and who does also work in your desired clinical specialty. The second letter of reference that we typically ask for comes from a professor or an instructor in your applicant's undergraduate course of study. If you can't find someone from that category, uh, you don't have any connections with your instructors, your instructors are no longer employed at that university, we will approve that the second letter does come from another second licensed and practicing physician in the criteria above. We do ask that one letter also come from your current or former employer just so that we know uh, that you, you were a good uh, employee, that you did have that clinical experience at that place. We do ask that we get the NBRC verification letter, and what this is, it comes officially from the NBRC website. If you are a registered respiratory therapist, you can download the letter template, save it as a PDF, and then you can upload it to your application. Also, if the applicant doesn't have an Ohio license for respiratory care, we will help assist you in getting that license so that you can begin your clinicals here in the state of Ohio. The process that we go through for you to start getting ready to come to our program, we have you fill out the application on OSU's Graduate and Professionals Admissions website. So you can see the websites listed there, hrs.osu.edu. That is the start of the ball rolling. You'll be up, uh, uploading all of your information to this. This is again where uh, we will ask for those reference letters. We'll ask for your uh, 
undergraduate uh, requirements and also your statements uh, that you will personally write. Uh, we'll also get that MBRC letter. During the time that we get your application, our division will go ahead and review your applications. The application process does open November 1st, and we typically review until February 1st. All applicants who are considered competitive will be asked to come in for an interview starting in March, and then admission decisions for all candidates will be notified uh, beginning of April. We put this statement out there because there are a lot of people who have different circumstances as to how they got to the point that they have a bachelor's and a respiratory therapy degree. And we don't wanna answer anything specific today, but we just encourage anyone who has a bachelor's of science degree and an RRT to apply to our program. Some important dates for you to note, as I mentioned before, the application opens on November 1st. December 31st is a priority deadline for those who may be applying for university fellowships. February 1st is the actual application submission deadline for us to review your application for possible admission. As I mentioned before, we'll be doing the interview process during March and notifying applicants in April of their admissions decision. But some important university dates to note if you are admitted to the program and accept the uh, application. Uh, early August tuition is due for the autumn semester and then the third week of August is typically when classes begin for the semester. We're now gonna move on to some of the program resources. The MRT program will emphasize an advanced problem solving, critical thinking, clinical reasoning, and management of the differential diagnosis to support the level of advanced practice expected of the advanced respiratory therapist in the coming decades. In addition, it is expected that the graduate will also be prepared to be a critical consumer of the scientific literature and to support clinical research in the healthcare arena. The first year of our program focuses on the didactic and laboratory experiences needed for advanced level clinical practice, peer reviewed evidence for respiratory care, and ethical issues of advanced practice. Several courses were strategically included in the initial curriculum of the program so that students will be training alongside other student healthcare practitioners. The second year introduces advanced clinical experiences, including diagnostic testing, differential diagnosis, clinical reasoning and decision making, the program includes approximately 1,000 clock hours of supervised clinical practice by licensed physicians in a clinical specialty. Each clinical experience will require a satisfactory level of performance across clinical competency and professional behaviors with the criteria for a satisfactory completion increasing between the first, and two, the first two clinical practica. That's 8189 and 8289, as you can see in the graph above. What we'll see is that um, the subsequent clinical practica that you'll see in 8389 should also start to see an increase in your completion of your, your competency. Also during respiratory therapy 8389, each student will complete the data collection needed for their master's examination. The students will also establish individual goals approved by the clinical site in the program with a focus on refining their skills for MRT practice. This is where some of your input would uh, help guide direct where you would like to go clinically so that we can get you into the field you'd like to see. As you can see, we usually uh, have two specialty areas that most of our students will be practicing, adult care and pediatric care. Here in the Columbus area, we have two wonderful hospitals that our students will be participating in clinical experiences. Uh, the first is going to be the OSU Wexner Medical Center. Uh, OSU Wexner Medical Center celebrating our 27th consecutive year ranked in U.S. News and World Report's best hospitals list. The U.S. News consistently ranks Ohio State as one of the top hospitals in Columbus. Ohio State consistently receives excellent scores from these ranking systems, and these results demonstrate our dedication to providing safe, compassionate, leading-edge medical care to the people of Ohio and beyond. We are ranked in several specialties as well, pulmonology being one of them, and it's recognized as one of the specialties as high performing. When we talk about our pediatric experiences, we have Nationwide Children's Hospital here in the local area. And again, they have been named um, as one of the best children's hospitals on a roll at number seven. The honor roll is a top distinction awarded to only 10 children's centers nationwide. The 2019-2020 Honor Roll designation marks the sixth consecutive year that Nationwide Children's has received this recognition. In addition, the services, equipment, and facilities of the Clinical Skills Assessment Center at the College of Medicine, the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences as part of the College of Medicine, are also available to the school at no additional cost. 
This facility will be reserved for the MRT students to engage in simulation and laboratory skills practices for the competency assessments. The MRT students will also have several opportunities for interprofessional simulation with other health sciences educational programs, as well as physician trainees on our campus. Our competencies will also be assessed during these simulations and the participation in the simulation allows the students additional opportunities for team leadership, evaluation, and critical thinking. The next slide just kind of introduces you to areas of where clinical rotations could occur. We do welcome the addition of more excellent clinical sites as we develop the program and keep building our curriculum. One thing that we uh, are stressing here is that you will have the opportunity to do not only inpatient side, but also the outpatient side of both pulmonary clinic and sleep medicine clinics, both from the adult and pediatric realm. As you can see, we look into multiple ICU locations that would give the, the participants here the opportunity to seek uh, interest in where they find uh, their clinical relevance uh, emerging, as well as in the emergency departments, anesthesias, and long-term care facilities. Discussing the student expectations will be the last section that we'll talk about. What we're going to kind of begin with is how our program received the approval. So as we've mentioned before, there was a lot of data collection to get us to this point. And once we were ready to submit everything to the university in the state of Ohio, we did get our university approval in 2016 and our Ohio Department of Education approval in 2017. That allowed us to actually start developing the curriculum, get everything in place, work with the other colleges, College of Nursing, College of Medicine, to line everything up to get ready for our approval through COARC. Our COARC accreditation started with our letter of intent to offer the accredited APRT program, and that was approved in July of 2019. We completed our necessary self-study, and that was completed in September of 2019. We had two visitors from the COARC come for our site visit in November, and our site visit was completed at that time, which allowed us to go to the board for provisional accreditation, which was given to us in December. This then allowed us to admit our first cohort of students who began in spring semester of 2020. MBRC credentialing allows uh, us right now currently to use the specialty exams as a form of the exit exams in credentialing for these students. They do maintain the right to use the RRT AP and APRT for credentialing and professional designation purposes. And as more programs develop and we see more and more need for the credentialing, we find that they will start to develop their own credentialing exam for the APRT. The outcomes that we hope that you will receive is becoming a successful completed student of the program. We hope that you will demonstrate advanced clinical skills in a cardiopulmonary practice area, contribute to cardiopulmonary disease management and health promotion. You'll be able to demonstrate communication skills to effectively participate in and lead professional teams. The students will be able to translate research to RT practice and application of evidence-based practical clinical guidelines. You'll be able to demonstrate skill in measurement, data collection, and analysis of patient care outcomes, and demonstrate an understanding of medical ethics applicable to respiratory care. We are now gonna take a look at the questions that were submitted and go through a discussion session here, and I'll turn it over back to Georgiana to go over these questions. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, we've been monitoring the chat board the entire time, and uh, Sarah and I are splitting up the questions. I'm starting out with some, some um, questions that might, you might have been thinking of yourself. Uh, the first question was about uh, credits and expiration. So if I got my BSRT uh, several years ago, how long ago does it matter? And um, our answer is that those credits don't expire. <laughs> uh, we have a holistic admissions process. So the admissions committee considers your, your transcript and your GPA as one data point. Uh, as Jessica shared before, there are several other pieces to the application that include your letters of reference, your statement, your personal statement that talks about your goals and why you're interested in becoming um, an MRT student. So we consider lots and lots of things uh, for your application, um, one of which is, is your credits and your GPA from uh, your preparation. The next question we got uh, was an easy one to answer, um, and that is how many students do ex expect per cohort? Um, we are COARC approved. We have provisional accreditation from COARC to have 15 students per cohort. 
And I hope that answers your question. Um, the next question was specifically about the AS to BS program that we have through our health sciences program here online at The Ohio State University. And the question was about would that qualify? I can tell you we are currently working on a letter of intent for COARC uh, to have that approved as a degree advancement program as well. So um, uh, I guess the, sh the, the short answer is yes. As Jessica stated before, we encourage everyone that's interested in the MRT program to please apply for the program. And again, we will consider individuals and we will consider you using our holistic admissions process. So those were the end of the questions that I have. Um, Sarah has some great um, information for you to provide um, some in information about licensure and the legislative update from um, the OSRC. So I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you. Okay, so first, actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to address a question that was posted that said that there was, um, in some conversations that this individual had had with others, that some are saying that they can't see a difference in the advanced practice respiratory therapist and an RRT practicing at the top of their scope. And I, I do want to address, there are a lot of misconceptions out there. Um, again, the AARC, the NBRC, and COARC um, got together, actually started probably about even five years ago with this, with their joint committee, and, and they realized it was they were starting a definition of an advanced practice respiratory therapist that they were simply describing an RRT practicing at the top of their scope. So they actually had to take several steps backwards um, and they wanted to make it very clear and that's why the very first um, definition that's included, the part of the definition says that it's really not, it's a separate scope of practice. And I think that as, um, as more programs um, continue to develop and we get the word out there, there's more conversations that are occurring um, uh, in the public about the advanced practice respiratory therapist, hopefully that will um, um, get, become a little bit more clear that there is a distinct and separate co scope of practice for an APR team. That does dovetail a little bit, that scope of practice conversation does dovetail a little bit into, um, there was a question about licensure. And so I'm going to take off my program faculty hat and put on my Ohio Society for Respiratory Care Legislative Committee hat and tell you that the OSRC has taken a very aggressive approach to developing um, licensure for advanced practice respiratory therapists in the state of Ohio. Um, they actually have conducted six um, information sessions. A lot of them were designed to address exactly those misconceptions that the first question that I addressed was about. Um, and we're traveled throughout the state of Ohio talking about advanced practice RT and talking about a legislative agenda and a legislative strategy. Um, and really, um, the, not, the short version is that the OSRC plans to hold a series of three meetings um, with all stakeholders to be invited to the table. And so that will include um, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, um, physician groups, um, hospital association, pharmacy board, um, variety of different individuals that will have us that have an interest and a stake in the development of licensure for an advanced practice respiratory therapist. And through that series of three meetings, um, hope to come to some agreement and understanding, address any myths or misconceptions that are out there, and to hopefully garner support or at least have no opposition to moving forward with a new legislative agenda. This is a similar process that we use when um, moving to RRT uh, required for initial licensure in the state of Ohio several years ago. Um, so we're optimistic that we will, the same process will um, result in a positive outcome. Um, I, I think the next um, question that follows right after the licensure question is about employment opportunities. And so one of the questions was, you know, what, this is a big investment both in time and, and in money. And so what employment opportunities uh, do you foresee being available for graduates? Um, while that is not something that I have direct control over, I will tell you that we have been working very closely with both Nationwide Children's and the Wexner Medical Center as clinical sites um, to also be developing employment opportunities. Um, and so uh, they plan to work together with administrative teams to become um, kind of maybe the first employers for the graduates of this program as well. There's really no current uh, job description that exists, so that's kind of where they've started working on what a job description would look like um, using some of the sample documents that um, the um, 
the national committee has put together. Um, and then we're gonna work really hard to find niches and opportunities that currently exist where there is a gap in care. Um, no plans to try to take positions away from other advanced practice providers that already exist, um, but to develop those niche opportunities um, so that they can practice at the level at which they're educated. Um, and the um, job descriptions and the conversation about employment opportunities, again, occurring at, at both of those uh, facilities, um, have included HR. And so um, developing a position description that is at that advanced practice level has been their, their um, work over the last six months or so. So it's happening. I, I, I can't say that there's current job postings, um, but I think it's, it, there is development. Um, of employment opportunities as we move forward. I will also tell you that in having lots of conversations around the country, there are lots of other facilities that are very interested in um, developing positions um, for advanced practice respiratory therapists. I don't know that any are as far along as the ones locally are, but obviously they have some, some motivation um, to, to do that. Um, another question real quick, um, is this program available online? It is currently not available online. Um, the core courses through the College of Nursing as well as the HRS courses are all only available in person, both the NP program and the, the other graduate programs at, for physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, athletic training that are involved in those courses um, are all in person as well. So no opportunities for online at this time. Um, and so then the follow-up to that is, since this is an in-person um, program, how many days per week and hours per day do, does an individual need to kind of dedicate towards the curriculum? Um, we are committed to trying to consolidate the, um, the time that the student spends on campus. And so um, for their didactic and their laboratory work especially, so we're trying to consolidate to one or two days a week, depending on the semester. Um, then for clinical opportunities, um, it depends on the semester. There is an opportunity to, um, in the summer, it's a part-time clinical, um, and so it works out to about 24 hours per week. So depending on the rotation, that might be two days a week, might be three. Um, and then during the last two semesters, um, closer to 32 hours per week, again, could be done in a couple of days, um, depending on the schedule. So I'm um, trying to make it as user friendly for those that are continuing to um, work part, at least part time as RTs while they're in the uh, program. Um, looks like there was one more question about uh, reimbursement opportunities. So that's, that is something that the national committee that includes AARC, NBRC, and CARC representatives, the um, kind of the legislative um, person that works on legislative affairs for the AARC is um, an active member of the committee and um, has been having discussions about the opportunities for reimbursement. Um, currently, um, bachelor's prepared respiratory therapists um, are able to charge for some services, but um, since our profession is at an associate entry level, we're not recognized as providers. And so that's a bit of a challenge, um, definitely something that the committee is working on. Um, and it totally depends on the employer and their um, practice models for physicians. Um, there is an opportunity to build incident to physician services for anything that an APRT or an RT does provide. And so um, there could be um, some other payment models that might be um, possibilities as well. So that is a current, actually for 2020, that is one of the um, objectives for the committee. So there'll be more information coming out about that very soon. I think at this point, I'm being told that there's no other questions coming in. Um, at, we would like to really thank you um, for your time. We hope that we were able to address how and why the MRT program was designed, the requirements of the program, benefits um, for earning your MRT at OSU, details about the application process, resources that are available to you, and what you can expect as a student in this program. We appreciate your time. Um, I would encourage you that if you have any additional questions to use that email address that was on the screen just a few minutes ago. Um, and someone in our grad services will address your question or pass it along to us depending on what it is. Um, if you do have, again, an individual question about your specific circumstances, please feel free to contact us. We appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much.